I'm so excited to be here with you uh, this morning. Doesn't it feel good to be in the house of God? He's already doing something this morning. I hope you feel that in your spirit. And uh, we've been in the middle of uh, a series all about miracles, all about miracles. We've been talking about the goodness of Jesus that we can see through the course of miracles. And uh, some of the miracles we've talked through, calming the winds when Jesus said, peace be still. The goodness of God and how he can talk through the power of, of peace in our lives. So we've talked about water to wine and the transformation that comes from Jesus when we experience him. When we encounter Jesus, we don't leave unchanged. Amen? Amen. We talked about the feeding of the thousands and the provision of Jesus. He is so faithful to provide. We've talked about healing the leper. Aren't you thankful that there is no mess that is too messy for Jesus to interact with? And this morning, we're going to talk about one of those more unique uh, miracles. One of those miracles that through the course of Scripture, as we, I remember reading growing up, I was like, Jesus, really? Like, this is, you're the son of God, and this is how you decided to reveal yourself? Because you'd be crazy. But I want you to know that this miracle, as crazy as it sounds, as we unpack it together, that it wasn't just for yesterday, but he wants to do miracles in your life this morning. He wants to do healing and restoration and deliverance, salvation, the greatest miracle he wants to do this morning. And so I'm wondering, what could he do in this place if we just gave him the space to do it? We were singing about it. If we could just make room for the Spirit of God, what could he do? So if you want to open up your Bibles with me, jumping into John chapter 9, starting with verse 1, you can read along with me on our app, in your Bible, or on the screen behind me. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me well. It is this day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated as sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is this not who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Heather said, uh, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, My man called Jesus, a man called Jesus, made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Lord, we pray that you would give us sight this morning. Open our eyes, Father, to see what you're doing as we talk about even some of the broken parts of our lives, some of the challenging parts of our lives. I pray, Jesus that you would give us an ability to trust your hand, to trust your heart, to trust your goodness, Jesus. And in your name, everybody said, amen, amen. Now, I want you to take your hand, and I want you to give a good, solid spit in it, and I want you to give a high five to your neighbor. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's sick. That's gross. Some of the youth students are like, I already did it. But give, give a high five to your neighbor, okay? Give somebody a high five. We all need some love. If you're streaming, give me a high five emoji because we all need some love, amen? And before we go any further, I just want to take a few moments to go back. And if you're wondering if you heard this story right, well, you probably did because remember I said it's kind of crazy. It is crazy. Yes, we did just read a story where Jesus spit in the dirt and then got his fingers all in it, and then took it and put it in somebody's eye sockets. It's kind of crazy. That's good. Amen. 
Surely not a, a COVID-friendly uh, miracle, we'll say. We're coming out of the day and still amidst dealing in the day of COVID. And we're still in a place where when you're out at Target and somebody coughs, <coughs> everybody goes. <laughs> Every time we cough, we got to clarify that we're not, we're not coughing, we're choking, right? I'm just choking. I'm not coughing. And I imagine that as Jesus was doing this, there were some people like I do at Target, Target giving him the, the stare, the COVID stare, you know what I mean? And then I also want to elaborate a little bit. I've got a, a big uh, pile of dirt up here in this bucket you can see. And um, you got to realize, okay, that he was making mud. This was not a little like baby, you know, there wasn't a little, little like a, no. This was a mouthful of spit because he got to make mud. So I'm going to demonstrate for, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I promise I won't. And I know I'm probably ruining your um, white clothed, uh, flowing brown hair, blue sash Jesus. Because that was not the Jesus that we saw here in John 9. We see a Jesus with attitude, unafraid to get a little bit dirty. We see the carpenter Jesus, amen? And the truth is, you might be sitting here uh, this morning wondering, why such a scene, Jesus? Like, we know he could have just healed this man right away. We know he could have in an instant just said, give this man sight, and it would have happened. He had that kind of power. Why all the, the mud and the spit and telling him to go wash? Like, what was the point of this, Jesus? Why such an ordeal? Why such a process? And I want you to know that you're in good company because I've been wondering the same thing this week. And we're going to discover together why this morning he spit in the dirt. You ready to find out with me? If you're taking notes, you can title this message, Trust the Process. Trust the Process. Turn to your neighbor and say, Trust the Process. Trust the Process. This is a phrase that I became rather, uh, we'll say, loathsome to a few years back because Kirsten and I had started our year January 1st, and we called it a year of fitness. You know how we do that sometimes on January 1st? This is going to be the year of fitness for me. Usually lasts a few months, maybe a day or so for you. I don't know. But this was going to be the year. And when it comes to fitness, we know that, gosh, it's, it's a process, isn't it? It's a bit of a process. You can't just diet for a day and see results. Don't you wish it could be that way? I wish it could be that way. But no, it takes more than a day. It takes days weeks, sometimes years even, for us to experience the results of fitness. And I would love to say that I'm good at the whole process, but I have this issue. I can do the whole thing. I can eat really good all day. I can intermittent fast. I can count my macros. I can even have a good workout, a good run. But then about 9, 10 o'clock comes around. My kids are in bed. The house is quiet. And this craving creeps out of the darkness. And I'm telling you, I turn into an animal. A ravenous, I turn into a ravenous animal. And I tell my wife, because I know 9 o'clock is coming, don't put any snacks in the house. If they are here, hide them from me. Because I will find them. Hide them from me. But that doesn't change the fact that this beast rises up inside of me. So I tell you what. I become a hunter for sugar and fat in my house. Anything I can find, I will eat. Anybody identify with me? I'll eat anything. Banana baby food. I've done it. <laughs> Peanut butter. Oh, I've done it. Shredded cheese. Anybody? I've gone for the shredded cheese. Or coffee creamer. That's one of my favorites. You all think I'm crazy. Do not judge me. I'm just dealing with it, okay? I was talking with a friend recently at my parents' house, and we were sitting around their uh, dinner room table, and this subject came up, and she was sharing with me that she had the same problem. You know, this, this animal-like craving that comes out after 9 o'clock. And she shared with me that, the lowest point for her is when she went for vitamin gummies late at night. <laughs> and I would love to say that I laughed at her, but I just nodded my head and I said, I've been there too. 
vitamin gummies. I have had maybe a few nights or so, one too many of Maddox's little Flintstone vitamin gummies yes. and his melatonin gummies, because I do that because I'm a bad parent, you know. But melatonin, and I'll say, I mean, I slept really good that night. Those things be tasty, nice and sweet and gummy. When the cravings would come, I would always look at my wife and say, is it worth it? This is so hard. I have to deal with this every night. And she would always say the same thing. Zion, stay strong and trust the process. Trust the process. And I hated it because she was right. <laughs> she was absolutely right. Because anything worth having is a process. Am I right? It's a journey. But I can tell you this, when it comes to our relationships with Jesus, the process is always worth it. It's always worth it. Have you ever been on a long run before? I'm talking like a long run. I'm not, I'm not talking from like your car to the inside of Target because it's hot outside. I'm talking a, like you put on some tennis shoes and you go and you run and you have like maybe a, a map outlined of what you're going to do and there's a middle part. I'm talking there's a long middle part, okay? I struggled to find a sport in my life uh, because, well, I just, I did. I tried soccer and then my brother and sister got better than me, so I gave that up because that wasn't going to happen. And then I tried football. Uh, I did flag football and I was really good at it, and then we started hitting each other, and my heart was just too gentle for that. I couldn't do that. So then I found running, and I was like, I'm gentle. This is tender. I could do this. I could make this happen. So I signed up for cross country. Signed up for cross country. Talk about some long runs, okay? And, you know, I signed up, and I loved it. I just had one problem, okay? One problem pretty big problem. You see, I loved the starting line. I loved the anticipation, the weight of the pop of that gun. I loved it. I loved sizing up all the other runners, those, you know, those little shorts that we can barely call shorts because they're so little, you know, sizing everybody up upon the size of their legs or in cross country how little their legs are because when you're a good runner, they're little, you know, sizing everybody up. And then I loved the finish line. Everybody likes a good finish line, right? Was I ever the one that broke the ribbon in first place? Not even close. But I had some personal bests, okay? And there was nothing like that last 100 meters when you're running and you got your family and your friends cheering you on. Oh, the finish line is incredible. It didn't matter what place I got in because the finish line was always that incredible. My problem was not the starting line or the finishing line. It was the fact that I hated the middle part. And the middle part in cross country is really long. It's called cross country for a reason. You're running like across a country, it feels like at times. I don't like middle parts. Does anybody like middle parts? The middle parts of running. If you just said yes, you are a sick person. <laughs> Sam DeBose, I heard that. You are sick. We don't like the middle parts because it's uncomfortable. Sore ankles and side cramps and shin splints. Ain't nobody like a shin splint, right? Because the process of start to finish is a road of commitment, perseverance, self-control, and trust. Now, that sounds like a party I want to go to. Anybody else? But the truth of it is, in cross country, I had to decide whether or not the finish line was worth me facing the middle part. Was it worth it to me? And unfortunately, I only lasted one season because I just didn't think the lack of comfort through the middle part was worth how much I loved the finish line. And unfortunately, I think that's how many of us live our relationships with Jesus out. We don't like to face it when we're uncomfortable. And we never actually experience the fullness and the wholeness of Jesus because we can't stick through the process. And I want us to learn some things from this scripture we just read. Because Jesus, he teaches us a thing or two about the importance of the process. Because there was a process as to which this blind man showed up in front of Jesus that day. The disciples, they allude to it a bit. 
they give us an indication because they ask Jesus, was it him or his parents that caused him to be blind when he was born? They knew that he had been born blind. It means they had passed this man before. They had probably known him for a long time. They passed him who knows how many times. And so out of curiosity, they ask that question. Truthfully, there was a lot of crazy beliefs when it came to the Jewish tradition at this time about physical ailments. And Jesus responds with a curveball, something the disciples never saw coming because he looks at all of them and with such compassion in his heart for this man, he says, neither. In fact, my God made this man blind so that you could see his goodness and his greatness on this day. Wow. And I think the real reason why sometimes this passage makes us feel uncomfortable, on the surface level, it's the spit in the mud because it's kind of weird, but I think really deep down, it's because here in this scripture we get a glimpse behind the curtain, behind sometimes what we see in this earthly realm, what God is doing in the will of God, and we don't like what we see because what it alludes to, what it shows us is that sometimes our pain and our discomfort is a part of his plan. And we don't like that, do we? Because it doesn't fit into that all-loving, all-gracious God archetype that we like talking about in the Western church, don't we? Have you ever really thought about maybe some of the injustices in your life? Maybe ask the question, God, if you are so good, then why would you let so much bad happen? If you loved me, then why wouldn't you have prevented this from happening to me? And that's how many of us see it, our perspective of God. Our understanding of God goes as deep as our comfort and our perspective of justice and our idea of fairness. But we have it so wrong. Because when we see life through that lens, we fail to see the big picture, what I like to call the, the God picture. If I could only have had the voice of Kirsten Rempel when I was a teenager, because I had not met her yet, when I was a teenager, say to me, Zion, stay strong. Trust the process. There's a process that's happening. Trust the process. I think just maybe some of my young adulthood would have looked a little bit different. Because that's what this is, isn't it? It's a process. So many of us are walking through processes. But the thing I love about a process is there is always an end in mind. And we may not be able to say that the process is free of pain, but I can tell you this, that the process when initiated by Christ it will always be full of purpose, his purpose. And I want you to hear this, to trust his hand or to know his love and to know his heart is to trust his hand. And if the hand of God is behind something, then you can know and be confident it'll be worth it. It'll absolutely be worth it. Let me show you what I mean. I want to flip back in the pages of Scripture for a few moments and take a look at some of the processes we see the Lord lead some Bible characters through. And what I love about these processes is we're able to get a glimpse behind the curtain because the truth of it is in life, we don't always get a chance to see behind the curtain. But Scripture, it allows us to do that. It gives us a few moments where we can see what's going on behind the curtain. And if we can see that his goodness was doing something amazing back then, then maybe we can just learn to trust his hand in the present a little bit more because he's still the same God, isn't he? And so the first example I want to share with you is what I'm going to call the process of discipline. Aren't you happy you came to church this morning so we could talk about <laughs> discipline? I hate that word, discipline. It may, makes me just think of wooden spoons and paddles. Anybody else? I had a few of those in my day. Did you know that my mom actually broke a wooden spoon on me once? I was just that bad of a kid, okay? But what did we just say? To know the love of God 
is to trust his hand. And sometimes I think we forget that discipline is actually in our favor, isn't it? And bear with me. I know this is a tough one. This is a tough thing to hear. Discipline is my world right now because I am the father of a three-year-old. And we're, we're trying to figure it out in our household. And I tell you, sometimes my son, Maddox, will react very dramatically to the most minimal of disciplines. Like I merely just take away something that's going to hurt him, and he will freak out. Any other parents of toddlers, you know what I mean? Maybe you were a parent of a toddler at one point. You know what I'm talking about. And there's a trend going on in social media right now that just helps encourage us toddler parents to just stay the course because it's hard sometimes, all right? And sometimes we just got to laugh at how our children react to our disciplines, right? Even when they're minimal because they do overreact at times. And so I'm going to share with you a few things that I found uh, this week that just encouraged me. You can throw that first picture up there. This little boy, he can't drink the Easter egg dye, and this is how he's responding. <laughs> Super bad, right? Till the next one. I'm cooking her eggs instead of feeding them to her raw. <laughs> you think it would be in her uh, best interest to eat cooked eggs, but apparently not. Go to the next one. His brother is also on a swing. <laughs> this is the relationship between Maddox and Cohen, my two sons right now. It's great. This is my house. I wouldn't walk across the bridge. I mean, that could have been bad, but not in his head, right? You can do the next one. I won't let her wash her face with the sponge that I use to clean the toilet. <laughs> so awful parents are, huh? And then there's one more, maybe. Nope, just kidding. There's not any more. Nope, okay, just kidding. I found one with this kid. He was uh, um, chewing gum, or he was throwing a fit, and the mom said that uh, I took away the gum that he had found sticking on the side of the trash can. <laughs> I have experienced this before, actually, in my life with Maddox. So um, sometimes we act like toddlers when it comes to discipline because we don't realize that the discomfort is necessary for our future. And we see this in the life of my man Moses. I've been reading through the Exodus story from Exodus and beyond, and I was so convicted by a conversation I came upon at the end of Moses' life. And you know, sometimes we read the Bible like it's an Instagram feed, and we look for the parts that feel good, and we like skip over the ones that don't really. And I think that maybe I had missed this passage before because just didn't really feel that good, if I'm being honest. But I found it, and it convicted me to truly understand, really, the goodness of God, even when it doesn't feel that good. Because you see, Moses, he was at the beginning of the promise that led to a promised land. He was the one that was standing at the burning bush when the Lord spoke, when the I am that I am spoke of a land that would come flowing of milk and honey. And he was given the the uh, purpose of going to lead his people to freedom. And so what did he do? He did it. He went and he faced Pharaoh. He faced Pharaoh and he went through the plagues and he walked through a sea and he trekked through the wilderness. And then, just moments before he was about to see the inheritance of that promise, literally on the borders of that promised land, he does something somewhat unexpected. Something out of character for Moses, Moses, especially at this point in his journey. He sends out 12 spies to go look at what's going on inside the promised land. Sometimes, you know, when you read scripture, you just want to yell at the characters. Like, what are you doing? Why would you do this? Has God not been faithful thus far? Why would you question his faithfulness now? Why would you need to send in spies? Easy for me to say, right? But this was tough. Just a chapter before, Moses' own brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, they criticized Moses pretty intensely, saying that he's a, a weak leader. And I don't know about you, but when somebody criticizes me, I instantly become insecure in leadership. Moses was insecure, and so when the voices of the crowd began to shout out, I don't trust what's going on in that promised land. Let's send in spies. 
Because he was in a moment of brokenness, Moses became led instead of leading. And he sends in these spies, all the while inviting their critical perspective to be a part of the decision-making that would happen next. We should have stayed in Egypt, their reports said. There's no way we can do this, they said. And suddenly God spoke another promise, a disciplinary action, really. He says, not one man or woman from this generation will see the inside of this promised land. The Lord says this again directly to Moses just a few chapters later, that Moses, the man who had dedicated his life to sing the inside of the promised land and the people of God sing the inside of the promised land, that even he would not see it. And you know, sometimes we downplay the real consequences of our sins, don't we? Because 40 years later, again at the border of the promised land, this is what Moses says in, De in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24. Almighty Lord, you have only begun to show me how great and powerful you are. Scriptures describe that Moses was literally pleading with God at this point. What kind of God is there in heaven or on earth? Who can do the deeds and the mighty acts you have done? Please let me go over and see the beautiful land on the other side of the Jordan River. Those beautiful mountains in Lebanon. And watch this. Brace yourself because it's harsh. It stings a little bit. God says in return, that's enough out of you. Don't talk to me anymore about this. Go to the top of Mount Pisgah and look west, north, south, and east you may look at the land, but you will never cross the Jordan River. Ouch, right? And it would be easy to read this and see it as cruel, unfair, ungracious even. God, how could you do this after this man had dedicated so much of his life to your purpose, to what you wanted to do, to freeing your people? How could you do this, God? But that's small thinking, isn't it? That's toddler thinking, if you will, because it fails to trust the process. And greater yet, the goodness of God. Hebrews 12 says that, if you, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? Paul's talking about discipline. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. You see, the process of discipline is more about protection than it is about our pain. This painful process, it was necessary to protect the future of the Israelites. The Lord was solidifying their possession of the land of Canaan because it had become very, very clear that this grumbling generation was not going to be able to inherit the promised land like the Lord wanted them to. Can you imagine this generation of Israelites dragging their feet across the Jordan? Moses, it's so muddy down here. I can't even get my wagon across the Jordan. Or can you imagine these same people walking around Jericho, maybe around like the fourth time? Moses, it's so hot out here. Can't we just stop at like five? It's close to seven, right? They would have never made it. God cared enough about the Israelites' future to have them work through their past so they could walk forward, renewed instead of dragging all that dirty laundry behind them. And some of us, we're walking the process through addiction and restoration and healing, and it was because of our decision-making. Our choices put us there. And we pray and we pray and we pray, and God won't take away the temptations and it would be easy to see it as cruel, right? But don't you see? This is the process. As you face the demons in your past, the Lord is giving you a refined clarity so that you can carry the weight of your future. 
And you know what that tells me? Paul said it in Hebrews. You know what that tells me? He loves you. Because he's protecting. Like a father protects his children, he's protecting you. And it also says, it also tells me that he believes in your future even more than you do. Isn't that empowering? Isn't that powerful? And before we move on, I know I'm spending a lot of time talking about this, but I want to make sure that we talk about the power of redemption because I think sometimes in culture, we start assuming that when you fail, it's a part of your identity. And I want you to know and realize that Moses was not a failure. He was absolutely not a failure. At the transfiguration of Christ in the Gospels, a holy moment in Jesus' ministry, who shows up? Elijah and Moses. Moses is invited to one of the most important points in Jesus' ministry. He was not a failure. In fact, quite the opposite. He's also mentioned as a hero of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Failure has nothing to do with who you are. You may fail, but that does not mean you're a failure because you're still a son or daughter of the King Most High. And somebody needs to hear that this morning. You are not a failure. You may have failed, but that does not make you a failure because God is still working towards your future. And he wouldn't be if you were a failure, amen? The second kind of process we see in Scripture is the process of preparation. Theologians agree that David was roughly 15 years old when he was called by the prophet Samuel from the fields. And he had that horn of oil anointing his forehead, and he was anointed as the king of Israel. And did he become king? No. He just started waiting. (laughs) Fifteen years later, he became king. He was 30 years old. Fifteen years of waiting. And this was not a fun 15 years. Not a fun 15 years at all. Saul, the previous king, and him, he, they did not have like a mentor-mentee relationship. This was not like a, here, I'm going to teach you the ropes so we can do this together. No, this was not a passing of the baton. In fact, Saul, he tried to murder David for a good portion of that 15 years. David was not sleeping in palace suites. No, he was sleeping in caves. And he was not feasting. At king's tables. No, he was foraging for food. This is what the 15 years of waiting looked for, looked like. And yet David knew how to trust the hand of God. Because he knew that when the time was right, when he was ready, and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Israel was ready, the hand of God would position him right where he needed to be. Even when murdering Saul was a possibility right in front of him. Twice this happened. He could have done it. He could have become king with his own actions. He could have murdered this murderous man right in front of him. And yet, instead of doing so, he trusts the hand of God. Because David knew how to trust the process. Because he knew that if he was still waiting, then God surely was not done working. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, James writes. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, it was in those days that David learned how to survive the elements that he would face later on the battlefield. It was in those days of waiting that David learned how to have honor, a grounded honor that would protect him and his kingdom when his very son tried to split it in rebellion. It was in those waiting days that David met his most trusted allies and advisors. He was being set up, and while he was waiting, the Lord was working. And David was allowing his trials to produce exactly what James said, a steadfastness in his spirit. So that when the time came, David would be lacking nothing. David knew how to trust the process. And if you're still waiting, friend, I want you to know, God isn't done working. He's not done working yet. 
And remember the process. It means that there's an end in mind. An end will come. But don't get so caught up in the fact that you're waiting that you missed what he's working on. Because he's working on something. And sometimes we miss it, don't we? Because we're so caught up in trying to get to the other side that when we get there, we can't carry the weight of it. Because we didn't take the time to persevere through and be chiseled and refined in the process. That's what preparation is all about. And the last process we see in Scripture that I want to share with you this morning is honestly the hardest one to digest because it feels so unfair. This is the process of positioning. And I'm not going to spend too much time unpacking this because I think it'll just, it'll unpack for us pretty beautifully because those of you who understand the process of positioning, you know what I'm talking about. You can read the story of Joseph from Genesis chapter 37 through Genesis chapter 50. And if there was ever a story of unfairness, it's Joseph's. Because it's the story of how a favored son was betrayed by his brothers and became a slave. And then how that slave would become unjustly accused of a sexual assault and thrown in prison. And then in prison when he met a friend that promised he would get him out, was forgotten. And there he sat. Can you imagine how Joseph must have felt after all that? God, this is so unfair. And yet suddenly, out of left field, he is called on by Pharaoh, and he's standing in front of him, and suddenly he becomes the right hand of Pharaoh. And he saves his family, saves the future of Israel, saves the lineage of Jesus. You think it was a coincidence? No, nah, I don't think so. Because he was positioned precisely where he needed to be so that the Lord could lean in and use him when the time was right. And at the end of his story, Joseph says something so powerful. It's my favorite scripture in the entire word of God. So he's standing there, and he's, I imagine he's seeing it all start to make sense when you have those big moments in life, and it suddenly the light bulb just goes on. You know those moments, right? When you start to see, oh, I get it. I was betrayed by my brothers so I could be in, enslaved at Potiphar's house, and then I was a slave at Potiphar's house so that I could be thrown into prison so that I could be next to the baker. And then when the baker was reminded of the Spirit of God or by the Spirit of God to Pharaoh about that dream interpreter in prison, I could be placed here so that I could save the very family that betrayed me and the future of Israel. He says this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. It sounds familiar, familiar to another story, doesn't it? Maybe less details in the setup, not entire chapters by any means. But certainly, the details we need to know. It was a story of a young boy who was born and deemed as cursed from day one because he couldn't see anything. And you know, he spent most of his life alone because... He had an estranged relationship with his parents because when he was around them, all the neighbors would start to talk about all the assumptions, all the sins that they must have committed to result in having a, a son that had a physical ailment. Can you imagine how painful that must have been? And then day after day, begging for food, begging for something, probably sitting out of the side of the synagogue because that's where, that's where people were the most generous, all right? There was a different kind of day, and he felt the gentle steps of someone he hadn't because he had heard a lot of people. He couldn't see them, but hundreds and thousands maybe every day walking by him. Couldn't see them, but he could hear their judgment and hear their criticism. But this, 
this presence was different. And when he spoke, he didn't talk of cursing. He talked of purpose. And this was the day that mud became a miracle. This was the day that mud became a miracle. And you might be in this room this morning saying, Zion, my life is such a mess. I hear what you're saying, but you don't know what my life looks like. You don't know how far off course I've become. You don't know how I've screwed it up. There is no way that God could use any of this. And I want you to know, I've been there too. I've been there too. It was my freshman year in college, and I had made such a mess of my life. Sexual chaos, addicted to pornography, so confused, dealing with suicidal ideation, didn't know how to ask for help because at that point that was still such a, a taboo. So codependent on relationships in my life, I didn't even know how to think for myself. And I remember on my knees in my dorm room, holding my life like a pile of mud. And I remember holding it in front of Jesus like this and saying, look what you did. If you loved me, how could you let something like this happen? Like, do you see this? How could you let abuse in my life? I thought you said you loved me. I mean, it feels like you loved everybody else. Did you forget about me? And there in that moment, as I held mud in my hands, it felt like my life in my hands. The Lord spoke to me and he said, in such a gentle voice, Zion, you're missing it. See, I like to make miracles from mud. In fact, I make the most beautiful things from mud. Just you wait and see. Because you see, I've chosen, I've chosen to make a miracle of your life that when people see you, they don't see you, they see me my goodness and my love. And friend, you have to know, you have to know that that moment in my life was not an end. That was a beginning. It was an absolute beginning because there was a lot of cleaning that had to happen afterwards. A lot of heartache, a lot of counseling, a lot of asking for help, a lot of reliving memories. A lot of broken things I had to face, a lot of habits and sin addictions. But I can tell you what, when the mud was started to get wiped away and I started to see, it felt like for the first time in my life, I started to see what a miracle looked like. I look at my life now. I look at my wife, Kirsten, and our home and our ministry together. I look at my boys and my sons. I look at this place, the beautiful ministry that's happening here on a weekly basis, the lives that are being changed. And I'm having a hard time getting all this mud off. <laughs> it's a process. That's right. <laughs> May have overdone that teaching method. But... I see that's what a miracle looks like. What miracle can the Lord do with your mud? And I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to put away your notes yet because I want you to hear this final thing. This is my favorite part of the whole thing because I asked a question at the beginning that I haven't answered yet. Why did Jesus spit? Like really, what a weird thing, Jesus. And we can only infer what we think he was doing, but I would like to share three observations with you quickly. Just three observations. First, I think that Jesus was allowing, you know, the, the obvious 
condensation that was needed to make mud so that we could swing home this mud to miracle metaphor, right? But secondly, I think it was so that we could know that the hand of God is unpredictable. That I hate to use Christian cliche, but that the Lord works in mysterious ways. And when he does, he does. And there's always purpose behind it. But lastly, this is my favorite part. We now know, they didn't know at the time. I think Jesus knew. But with scientific advancement in biology, we now know that human saliva carries quite a bit of human DNA. And so when Jesus, he took that mud and he made clay with it and he rubbed it in that man's eyes, he wasn't just rubbing mud, but he was rubbing who he was into his eyes. And you know what I love about that is because that was the beginning, wasn't it? A process. Remember, this was a blind man. He had to go find this fountain. You don't think he had to ask for help in the process? Ask for directions? Jesus didn't even tell him what was going to happen when he got there. But he must have believed that what was going to be there was worth every step of the way, right? But what I love about Jesus is he never sets us up on a process and leaves us there to do it on our own. But he always walks with us every step of the way because it's who he is. And when he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he meant it. So if we could bow our heads this morning. We're going to take a few moments and respond. And there's a group of people that I want to speak to first. You're about to make the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. And if you're in this place and you're ready to commit your life to Jesus, you say, maybe I've heard about him. Maybe I lived with him at one time, but I've lost my way. And I'm ready to find Jesus again. If that's you this morning, I want you to lift your hand where you're at. Anybody in this room? I see your hand. Anybody? You're making the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. Put those hands down. All you got to say, all you got to say, I can't say it for you, but all you got to say right now, just say, Jesus, forgive me my sins and come into my heart. And say it with me, Jesus, forgive me my sins and come into my heart. Friend, you just made the greatest decision of your entire life. Now with everybody looking, if that was you this morning, I want you to be bold for a second because we want to celebrate with you. If that was you, I just want you to lift up your hand right now. And for church family, can we give it up for these amazing individuals? We want to give you a Bible right now. We don't want to miss you. But before we go, there's a second group of people that I want to pray with. And it's the people that would say I'm in the middle of a process. If that's you, if we could have everybody stand. We're going to go back into a worship song. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I'm asking if you would have the courage enough to come and stand up here with me. And take a few moments with your hands out like this, your palms up like this. And just allow the Lord to speak to you this morning. Just offer up your life and say, okay, Lord, I've tried to do it on my own, but it's just come up like mud. It's just come out dirty, broken, and rotten, and wrecked. But okay, Lord, if this is what you're doing, I'm going to trust your hands. And I'm going to say, Lord, make this mud something miraculous. Come on, let's sing together and you just take a few moments.